Hello, audience. Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with amazing creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. I'm Liz Hinline. I'm a director and creative director at New York Film Academy. Um, we will do 20 minutes of shop talk with the amazing producer, Daniel Solinger, and 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. Daniel is an incredible wealth of knowledge. You have the floor now, please ask questions. He's really available for that. And here we go. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Liz, how you doing? I am so great, it is so fun. We are, audience, we are very old friends. I was, I was gonna say, we shouldn't say we're old friends because, you know. Because we're young. We don't wanna use the word old ever, especially in Hollywood, <laughs> but we are really old friends and Daniel is one of these seminal, smart, really, he is a filmmaker himself, he is a director himself, but he's so pro the filmmaker and pro the director and pro the story um, as a producer that it is just incredible to talk with you about stuff. Um, what I know, I know you also are, are you know, teaching a little bit now. My question, I'm sure your students ask you this, how are movies getting made now? First of all, thank you, Liz, so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk about something I, I love, uh, which is producing movies. And um, I've done, uh, I'm coming close to 70, I think uh, over 60 movies. I'm coming up on my you know, 70, 70th movie soon um, and um, all independent films. And I always say each project has its own terrain to it, its own sort of emotional, financial, political landscape and every job sort of comes together in its its own unique uh unique way but it usually starts with somebody with a vision you know somebody who has an idea you know either often an actor or you know often a director who you know has a story that they have to tell and then it becomes through that that force of nature that power of their you know um that that they bring it to life and i'm there to help shape it and happen, make it happen so are you one of the first people that they have to like convince about that this project should be put out in the world? Um, like I said, each one is different. Um, I, am, I am usually not the first person they convince. Uh, usually uh, when projects come to me, I'm a physical producer. So usually the first person they have to convince is the person that's going to give them the money. I am usually not the person who does that. I have done that on occasion, but it's not really uh, my strong suit nor um, nor do I really want to be that person. I, I think there's other people that are better at, at fundraising than, than I am. I'm, I'm the guy that they usually have the money, they have the script and they don't, that now they need to make a movie. And I know how to take the script, break it down, budget it, help them cast, help them crew, you know, shepherd it through post, help them find, you know, an agent, distributor, help them get it out, you know, with the aid of publicity into the marketplace. That's, that's sort of where, you know, where I come in. And like I said, occasionally, you know, I, I may help uh, with a little bit of the funding or find, you know, but mostly not. Mostly they've had to convince somebody else to trust them with the, the money and then they come and I, I help them make the movie. Has your, have you seen, has your taste or your desires changed over the years of the movies that you will want to work on or the movies that you pass on? Well, I, I do feel like I'm, I'm, I get more and more picky over time because I just see the enormous amount of effort. You know, I'm just, I'm just very familiar with the enormous amount of effort that it takes uh, to make a movie, um, the enormous amount of time that you're going to spend with the other people in the, in the process. Um, so, you know, if, if, if I, you know, somebody, I'll, I'll take jobs sometimes just because, or movies just because I like the, the, the people involved. Um, but I've also taken, turned down jobs because I was just like, you know what, me and this person are not going to get along over two years, uh, over a two year period talking to each other 18 hours a day. Like, I just know like our personalities are not going to mix well, you know, and I've turned down jobs for that, that reason, you know. And so are you, uh, is there a budget and influence for for you coming on is are you agnostic well yeah you know i definitely like the my basement raises over time i'm pretty much at this point if it's not a, a full union production like i'm really not that interested like i might do it for you know a close friend but but i really have no interest in you know just trying to make it work below a certain budget that i can't do it, everything by the book you know that that my, those days are are, are kind of over for me 
Well, let's, let's, I would love to, so we're going to show one of your first uh, films that's got distributed and one of your final films that got distributed. Of course, those, the earlier films are where it's like by hook or crook, basically getting stuff done. For so sure. let's look at the trailers and I'd love to get your feedback on this after we said, all right, Charlie, play away. Get ready for the four star, cool, crazy, and controversial party movie with the number one soundtrack and some of the hottest rappers to ever hit the big time. Hip hop, break dance, freestyle, culture in the hood. The ultimate backstage pass into the world of rap. The party was everything. In the house. In the house. Featuring R&B's number one soundtrack from today's hottest stars, including Mac-10 and the Dog Pound, Busta Rhymes, and special footage from Tupac Shakur, the Notorious B.I.G. Straight out the hood, did good. And Ice T. And the fact that you could do this, and sooner or later these records started selling, just saying whatever we wanted to say, it was great. It was like God came and said. Here's something that you can do. Check out how hip hop and rap music came from the streets to become a driving force of our culture. Rhyme and Reason, the ultimate rap movie no one should miss. I remember thinking that anyone over 50 was ancient. And here I am. Don't be melodramatic. Where's my beautiful wife of 28 years? Mm, you reek of weed, honey. You do it. Yeah, but I handle that a lot better than you do. I won't stop. My whole life, I was barely there while you guys were growing up. You were a huge mistake. What? So was your sister. I feel my life starting to squeeze in on me. I feel really messed up. I get bored. I want my own sports car. <laughs> I mean, a midlife crisis. I'm just trying to keep up with yours, honey. Oh! I'm just sitting back and letting life do what it does. No! Can I read your cards? King of Knives. Whatever you're torturing yourself about, it's not worth it. He's not a child! Yes, he is! want to run away from everything. What did you do? I was supposed to make it look bigger. Birds, man. Y'all break down for real. All relationships have as much hate as they do love. And without the former, you can't appreciate the latter. Are you having a breakdown? Definitely. Yay. So... Tell me this, so that so you had your early, early New York film your, that was shot in New York, your sort of like last film that was just written out, out of New York. Would you have been able to do that? The producer you were that did Rhyme and Reason, would you have been able to handle King of Knives? Did you know, did, what, have you, what, was, what have you learned in the stop gaps, I guess, between um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a really great question. I, I had to think about it for a second. Uh, you know, my gut tells me no, you know, like when I did Rhyme and Reason was my first feature. It was a documentary. I didn't even know how to make documentaries, let alone features at that point. You know, um, I just I had a friend who uh, Peter Spire, who had been uh, nominated for an Academy Award and some uh, an investor had approached him and said, you know, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to make a I want to make a hip hop documentary, you know, and he brought me on to help. And, um, you know, we thought we'd shoot it all in like six months and, you know, cut it together in like two or three and have it out there, you know, and it ended up being an over three year process, you know, and it was it was a much so we I was learning so much then and and I hadn't done a, a narrative feature film, which has, um, you know, we did I, I had done like a lot of commercials and a lot of music videos and, you know, like the commercial and music video world, they're they're very short shoots, you know, and I would do a you know, I do a commercial or music video with somebody who works in movies and or TV shows and they would say, oh, you know, this is, you know, so much, so much, the, it's a, the canvas is so much bigger on a movie, you know, and it's, I was like, yeah, whatever, hater, you know, but then, <laughs> then I did my first movie and it was true. It's like, oh, you know, like you're dealing with, 
you know, like uh, your character arcs and you're dealing with, you know, like uh, all these company moves and, you know, like all these issues and things that, that you don't necessarily have to deal with, you know, on, on smaller format things. And, uh, and I, and I loved it and I, I really kind of never left since. That's interesting. And, and, you know, just looking at the I love, rhyme and reason at that time, which now that it's sort of, it, it is a piece of like history that what you made with oh, that yeah. documentary, but it also, those were also superstars at the time, correct? Like Buster Rhymes was, was. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was eventually we got to basically all the top rappers of the day. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your audience wasn't even born when that movie came out, but you know, like Brooklyn Academy of Music, played it you know recently you know as a, as a as part of a you know retrospective and you know it definitely has the, the trailer doesn't seem to have stood up over time but the movie itself does seem to stand up over time you know and it's interesting what and and so that was like also shooting that was a lot more of the wild west i imagine oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. As, well i mean documentaries you know yeah, yeah, documentaries are, are a just, just a different mode of production. You're working with a very small crew. You know, we traveled a lot of places, went all over, all over to to shoot the, the artists and their, you know, what they were doing. And um, yeah, it's just like, you know, the, the world of hip hop, you know, uh, was, you know, it was a, it was a it was not a conventional or traditional, you know, world uh, to, to be a part of. You know, it was definitely, um, you know, very unique and um, very chaotic you know mm -hmm. but uh, I enjoyed it and and so now with with like sort of like a very studio polished looking which looks great you know King of Knives what what are the considerations like now you're having a union crew now you're having like a lot of you know people with experience where where are you sort of more fine-tuning as a producer well, you know, I, I have to learn over and over again how important the script is. So it really, it all starts on the script. And I, and I, I feel very lucky that Kingdom Nights has like an excellent, excellent script and something to, to work, to, to build off of, you know? And um, so that's that's sort of the main thing. Like, I don't feel like there's anything I, I have to learn or I don't think there's anything new I've learned about filmmaking mm -hmm. in the last decade. Um, but there's you, I can never stop learning about people and how to how to uh, interface with people, manage people, you know, collaborate with people. And, you know, I'm still, I'm still learning how to, you know, be part of a, a, a creative team and, you know, um, cr you know, and make something that sort of maximized uh, the, 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 the creativity and, and avoids any sort of interpersonal drama, you know, like, so I would say like, that's, that's, that's the thing that I, I, I continue to learn the most on in terms of filmmaking, you know? So are you like, genre and like agnostic as far as like what you're going to take on now does it really I, matter? you know what i am genre agnostic but i find like i get sets you know just like when you go surfing you have like sets of waves that come in like mm -hmm. i feel like i like movies come in sets you know and like i went through you know a horror phase you know where like everything i was getting called about was horror you know right now i'm like in this political thriller you know uh phase i have two movies in post one we shot in guatemala and one which, uh, you know, deals with uh, undocumented, um, you know, people in the U.S., you know, and like, they're, they're, you know, so I'm feeling like right now the set that's come in is like these sort of political, you know, themed films, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, if I had to pick a genre that I like, I like action. I really like making, making action movies, but, but I'm very much at the mercy of what I'm approached to do, you know. But and do you get excited about like if you see a script that's like oh my god that's a whatever it is it's intense and it's big it's is that what like thrills you like when you don't know how you're gonna approach it? Oh, I love a good challenge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think I could be a producer if I didn't like a, a challenge. You know, and 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 I feel like being a good producer is just so much about problem solving. You know, so that's really that's really like sort of my my superpower and my wheelhouse. You know, like mm -hmm. so when I read something that looks like a provided certain types of challenges you know like I don't like the challenge of here's this movie that really cost 50 million dollars and we want to do it for 500,000 you know like that's not a challenge I want anymore no. you know no. but you know here's here's something that you know uh needs to be shot in a unique way or you know here's a whole sequence that we need to shoot underwater you know how how are we going to do that or you know like uh so you know stuff like that like oh wow I, I've got to think through it and 
I, my dad's an engineer and I think there's a, a little bit of that in me where it's like, I, I like trying to engineer like solutions to something that I haven't done before or I haven't seen before or, or what have you. Well, it's funny, when I was reading your bio, you know, I never knew you came out as a cinematographer. I, when I was at NYU Film School, I, I won an award for cinematography. Yeah, I did a lot of uh, lighting design and shooting when I was in film school, yeah. And that makes actually total sense in the engineering mind and the sort of, you know, the like, hmm. let's figure it out. Right. We have to do research, we have to talk to people, we have to do, there's a bunch of stuff to do and that's what DPs do. They like, they don't know it all. They, they call a friend, they research a thing, they go do a test, that's true. Do a thing, which is what I find is, is sort of really fun about being a cinematographer, which is different than being a director, which is a lot imploding. Like, right. what do I think? What does my emotional soul tell me? Like, what, what am I trying to say? Um, I just saw this really cool thing as a little going off the, the, the topic, but yeah. uh, a DP, uh, uh, Dante, um, I forget his last name, but um, he, he, he was just supposed to post on his Facebook that he was bouncing light off of Duvetine and to get a lighting effect. And I was like, what? Bouncing light off of Duvetine. But it, it did give like this really interesting texture to the light, you know, and like he's kind of like this is his thing that he's really practicing and experimenting doing it's, it's that engineering thing you're talking about like but it's giving like a really unique and interesting look to the to the light the quality of the light he must need a big lamp to do that though oh he's 18k he's bouncing yeah, exactly. an 18k off, exactly. of, off of yeah i think dante spinotti probably um because there's not there's mm. very few dbs named dante i want to also pivot for a second because what you said we were chatting before that i thought i want to know about that you said you in the last couple of years you really learned a lot about pitching and what do you think, what do you, th it's such an art form. What, what do you think when you, when you've seen something that's good or you felt like, oh, we did a good job. What, what are the factors with that? Well, I think the most important thing is under researching, understanding who you're pitching and what they're looking for, you know, because I feel like you can waste a lot of time pitching going and, and selling something that they don't want to begin with, you know? Um, so I think that's, I think the, the first thing is a lot of research into finding pitch into pitching the right person. And then I, w when you find that person, you know, I, I think the, it's so important to listen and mm. not talk, you know, like keep your pitches very short and, and, and listen to what they're saying, because they will tell you how they, you, they want you to be pitched they'll ask you like oh could this be done like this and oh yeah it could be done you know like you you know it's like <laughs> you know it's like if you if you if you if you listen more than you talk you'll, you'll probably get through a pitch meeting pretty well you know that's really good but interesting enough when i think about clients or you know people that one's pitching to typically i find people know what they don't want it's true yeah. they not necessarily know what they want because they only know what they've seen so they might want right. something that's derivative, but they might not know what they, but they know they, what they don't like. So it might be right. like the law of attrition in a way. Well, you know, Margot Robbie was interviewed before the Oscars uh, on the red carpet uh, this year. And she said for her production company, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a hell no. You know, like to try to avoid all that sort of middle squishy ground, you know, it's like, if it's not something that they're very excited about, then they're, they're, it's just a no, you know? Interesting. And, that, and that's there's like, a lot of that squishy ground, like, oh, it could be, or blah, blah, blah. let me talk to my supervisor, you know, whatever. You know? Exactly. And then let me kick it upstairs and talk to everybody about it and nobody about it. Because it, right, you exactly. find the best films are made through a vision, even if it's, if say, you option brought like through a vision as opposed to through a collaboration, through a team. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think, I think anything to work needs to have. Uh, a, a visionary leading it you know the, the visionary might be more than one person working together but uh, but i find like it, it takes a a singular visionary to uh pull a project uh through to completion yeah and sometimes it's not the director sometimes it's an right. oftentimes it's an actor that really wants has a part that they really really want to play or you know it, it, sometimes it's a producer who has a very clear vision and hires a director you know so I know you can you can only drop very few hints, but you you have a great film that's going to be in Tribeca Film Festival this. Yes, I have a movie called Clean that uh, uh, is going to be playing Tribeca Film Festival on June 18th um, at the Metrotech uh, Plaza. 
And um, I, I did it with Adrian Brody. He's the star, but he also, we produced it together. He did the music and, you know, um, well, I'm very excited about it. It came out really super awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait for the world to see it. And how was it being a co-producer together? I, I loved it. You know, I loved it on a lot of levels. You know, first of all, it was really great just for in terms of just in terms of like my ego to be working with somebody who has an Academy Award and suggest an idea and have them go, oh, that's a good idea. I'm doing it. And it's like, wow, I'm, you know, it's like, you know, it's like I, I, my ideas are worth something. Somebody actually somebody who who I believe in actually thinks that I have a good idea. That's 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 everything, you know. Um, well, as well as that, you didn't have to worry about the actor and, and you know, if the actor's a producer on the film they're 110% in the film as well. You know, they're, they're, there's less about worrying of coddling the actor, let's say. Well, you know, I'll be honest, you know, um, I, I've done many movies where the actor was the producer and the biggest challenge is letting go of the producing when they get in front of the camera. And, and, and I, have, I have movies, I'm not going to name them, where I, uh, I feel like they could have been better, but the performances suffered because they were thinking about producing when they were, supposed to be thinking about their 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 character um mm -hmm. in this case that was not the, the case i mean he's so awesome like he's just so natural that he can just snap into character and 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 perform you know but um but i have had that problem in other projects interesting so you still even though you they're your co-producer you still have to watch because i mean it just like as a cinematographer you have to, your job to keep the level high and keep it going well you know and it's also too so part of good producing is, and I'm, I'm about to go into a tv show where you know the the the, the director is also the person who's going to be signing the checks and so um you know uh when you know when i'm in search of circumstances like that i i'm very careful like I, I i hopefully they entrust me enough and give me enough authority that i can just handle stuff mm -hmm. but but when i do need to talk to them lunch break and after shooting stopped. Like I don't, I don't, I don't try to approach um, uh, uh, somebody, one of my partners who's doing a creative role, like in the middle of their creative process and say, oh, we have this problem. Oh, right. this check needs signed. Oh, like this, that, or the other, you know, it's always like, okay, lunch break here. I got this list of things I got to go over with you or we've wrapped for the day. Okay. Here, sign all these checks that we need for tomorrow. Right. You know, so I, I, you know, I really try not to you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting position being a producer. I learned this on my first narrative film is that just my presence on set can sometimes change the dynamic, you know, like the, mm -hmm. like directors can get nervous, like, oh, am I behind schedule or, you know, so, you know, so, some projects I sit there at monitor the whole time, you know, what have you, but if it's not one of those projects where I'm, I'm, I'm by the monitor the whole time, you know, sometimes just being on set can, can kind of ruffle, you know, like sort of change the, the, the energy. And I don't, I don't want to do that, you know, like, you know, and, and, and like trying to talk to, you know, a creative person about, you know, logistical or production or money issues, you know, when they're in their flow, you know, like I find the same thing, like you, you just don't want to, you know, you just don't want to, you, you want to create the, like the best atmosphere possible for them to, to create, because just that process is such a, like to do it right and to have something successful is, is just such a, an enormous undertaking that I, I really don't want to do anything that would put them at a disadvantage, you know? Well, that's amazing. That's a, you're talking about your sensitivity and your listening, you know, because like you're but it's interesting. It's all it sounds like almost like being an actor going on set like, OK, now I know everybody's going to like stand up in their boots. I'm going to walk over to monitor and I'm going to like like a decisive. Thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I just I just uh, this this uh, one of these political thrillers that I'm working on, you know, I kind of had that experience where I wasn't by monitor all the time. And I would walk on set and director's first reaction was like, I'm going as fast as I can. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't, I, I'm not telling you to speed up. I'm just here to see what's going on. You know, I just like movie making. I want to hang out. <laughs> all right. We have like a bazillion questions. So we're going to start with somebody here. All right. Marianne asks, what do you remember? Um, basically, what do you recommend to start gaining experience in production? I think here's the question. You've gone to film school and, or I'm, I'm bastardizing this question, let's put it that way. You've gone to film school and you basically went up the levels in production, right? You were like, you didn't just start at producing, you, did, mm -hmm. you went up, right? I mean, I don't know quite your, that producing history. What, what do you think are the pros and cons of, of both? And maybe well, you do both, basically. You know, let me put, let me, I'll just give a little bit of a, a story. You know, when I, 
when I was at, I went to NYU film school and, and when I was there, you know, there were other students I was there with and I would, I would grab any opportunity I had, oh, PA on this, you know, do that and run, you know, sound on that, you know, like I would jump at any opportunity, particularly ones that paid. And um, I had friends at NYU film school who were like, oh, I'm not going to do a PA job. I'm a director, you know, like, and, and I'm still around. I'm, I'm, I've made my living in this business for a long time and they're not in the business, you know? So I think, I think there's something to be said for that. Just like, there's nothing to it, but to do it and just sort of diving in, you know, head first, you know, in those, in those, the first decade, at least, you know, weekends, holidays, you know, um, meant nothing to me, you know, like I would just, I would, I would, you know, free paid jobs, intern, you know, like it didn't matter. I, I would do whatever came along, you know, and, 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 and do it, you know, oh, you're only gonna pay me, you know, uh, 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 you know, 500 bucks for a month worth of work. I'm, I'm in, I'm all in, you know, like, and, um, you know, cause I could do that when I was younger, you know, I can't do that now. I have kids and a wife and everything, but, you know, um, and I think that makes a difference. I think that kind of that, that, that zeal, you know, um, and that, that commitment to, you know, jump in with both feet, no matter what, you know, is, is important. Yeah. And totally being a sponge about learning, you yeah. know, and, and really doing that. And also, and this is the thing I've seen, and I've seen this, you know, recently on some sets that I've been not happy about is the, the like, once you accept a job, no matter what the pay scale is or what thing, one has to really just do it hundred percent. You don't just go there and start grumbling on it's set. True. You know, I find that that- Well, you can grumble. I'm just not going to hire you again. I'm going to be like, well, that's <laughs> exactly. that guy who grumbles. Exactly. That's you know, exactly That's what that guy we're... who grumbles. No, I'm, I'm, I'll find someone else. Thank you. Find someone who's happy to be here. Yeah, exactly. And if you if you committed to do it, I you know, I, that happens to me uh, somewhat. And, I, and it drives me crazy when like people like, oh, you know, I'm, I, they want to renegotiate their rate because, oh, this is more work. No, you, you, you signed up. I told you what it was. When you signed up, you know, like, you know, if you don't like it, then go find another job. You know, I don't know. I, that, that, that's one of my pet peeves, actually, is people who like, you know, don't give 100 percent or feel like, oh, well, you know, this is more work than I expected. You know? Exactly. Well, welcome to the film business. But you you signed on and, and, right, and right. like it or lump it. And sometimes it is more work. But, but I'm talking about the times where it's sort of like, OK, we have, let's say, a three day shoot. And that hasn't changed, you know, it's still a three day shoot. Like, what do you mean? Like, this was more than expected, you know? <laughs> exactly. Or it goes over 12 hours by like right. 20 minutes. Right. Um, That's true. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Nama, who I've totally bastardized your name. Sorry. What do you, what do you do when you get a script you don't like? Do you go on with, do you go on with shooting or do you pass? Well, it's a little situational. Ideally I pass, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have to admit there have been a few times in my career where like I needed to pay the rent and this was the only job that was available and I didn't, and I didn't think the script was good, but I, I had to take it just to, to make sure the rent was paid. So that, that there's definitely been those experiences in my life, you know, but in an ideal world, and especially as I get older and more comfortable, yeah. Like if I don't like the script then it's, there's no point in doing it. Do you take second reads on a script? Like say they said they took, you gave some notes and you're like, I don't think it's gonna work. It's not for me. And they're like, okay, we're gonna go do a rewrite. Can we come back to you? Would you do that? Oh, definitely. And you learn a lot about somebody, you know, like you learn a lot. So I get, I come on board very early often because when people go out to raise money they often need a budget to do that. So I'll get, I'll get hired to take the script and do a breakdown and a budget for them to go finance or do find financing and then come back, they'll come back to me six months or a year later and say, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's shoot it. We got the money now, you know, we want you to help us make the movie. Um, so you learn a lot about somebody, you know, like when you do that first read and you give notes and I'm, I'm not, you know, notes has a bad connotation and I'm not saying I give a lot of notes or whatever. I really try to understand what the filmmaker is doing. But you can tell in the way that they take the notes, whether they use them or not, mm -hmm. but their process of listening to the notes, whether they're going to be collaborative people or not, you know, um, the best of them will say, no, I don't think that works. And here's why. And they have a good reason, you know, and and but but sometimes people just get. You just you, you get you sort of hit a wall where they just don't want to change it because they don't want to change it. And and then that that's a that's sort of a red flag, you know, and then then the script generally is not going to get better, you know, um, as time goes on, in my experience. When you're doing a budget, because you know, being coming from not from that side, I've never done a full full a budget. 
you're getting involved with the script and then you would, I imagine, talk to the creative, the director, somebody, the writer, who, so you could budget it. What's, what is, I read this, Definitely. but what do you mean? Right. So in that point, is that when you start sussing out, oh, I thought they were going to be this way, the people, but now I can really see that they're very uptight and, and controlling or they're right. They actually know what they're doing and oh, wow, they're great to work with. Like, is that where you sort of, is that where it comes to fruition there? Yeah, just to some degree. I mean, the way those conversations usually go is um, somebody uh, says, we need a budget, but we, we only think we can raise $2 million. It has to be a $2 million budget. And no matter what the script is, I've got to try to figure out how to make that script for that amount of money. And usually it involves some sort of compromises. And then, and then I'll have the discussion with the director. Hey, you know, I've looked over, you know, I've done the, my, I've done my breakdown. I've done everything I can, you know, in order to pull this off, you know, we need to combine these characters. We need to cut out this location. You know, we have to do, you know, like these are my suggestions on how to, to, to make it happen. And if they're open to that, then, then, then they're, they're somebody that I'm going to be able to work with from production wise. Although I do have to say, oftentimes the best films that I've worked on had directors that did not compromise at all, you know, and sometimes like that is a good sign, even though it's mm -hmm. going to make my life hell, you know, like that, that they, they, uh, that they, they won't compromise on anything. But um, one of my mentors is a guy named Ian Bryce who produced um, uh, Saving Private Ryan. And, you know, he, he went to Steven Spielberg with a budget when he got the script and it was a hundred million dollars and Steven Spielberg got really upset with him. He's like, I am, I cannot make this for more than uh, $60 million go, go back and try again. And so what he did was he went back, he listed all the things that Steven Spielberg couldn't have in order to make the movie. And then he came back and said, well, here's your $60 million budget. And here's all the things you can't do. And Steven Spielberg was like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Oh, I need the crane for that shot. Okay. I can't do that. I can't, you know, and, um, and it very much, it works, it works for Steven Spielberg the same way it does for me, you know, right. on indie films, you know, it's the same process, you know, that's great. That's really great. Um, this is a good question. Hannah asks, what is the best advice you'd give to a new producer starting a new film? There's so much, so much advice I want to give a new producer starting a new film. Um, but um, gosh, um, I mean, it's going to be important that you like and have a good relationship with, with the, your director, you know, like, cause you're going to be in the trenches with them for years to come. So, you know, just, I mean, I think that's the first and most important thing, you know, um, I would say, don't be afraid to get help. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had a friend who uh, was a PA for me, horrible PA. He, <laughs> my client came up and said, did you know that somebody was sleeping over there? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's my PA, right? And, um, and uh, but he went from that job to convincing a bunch of people that he could produce their movie. He went and hired the best unit production manager he could find and afford. Mm -hmm. And he asked them a lot of questions and he, he, he surrounded himself with people who could do his job better than him. And he, he totally won. It was totally right. a good move. Wow. So yeah, that, that, is, that is for everybody. That begins, don't be the smartest person in the room. You or surround yourself with good, good people. You just, they make, they make you look good, you know? 100%. That simple. So yeah. do you have a consistent team that you roll with? I, I do and I don't because, uh, you know, I, I travel a lot for my movies. So like, um, like I said, I just did a job in Guatemala. You know, obviously that's a different team. Some, I have this, this, this TV show that I'm doing in LA. I did last season, you know, it's pretty much all the same crew, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but then if I go to New York, it's a, it's a different crew, you know? So, um, I do try to work with people consistently, but I, again, it's sort of like, you know, I was talking about how the movies or genres come in sets, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like working relationships sort of uh, are veins, you know, like there, there's yeah. there's a time that I'll work with a particular DP on several movies, yeah. you know, and then we'll sort of go different directions and then it'll be, you know, product, you know, as I find that that's very common. Now I'll, I'll do a set of movies with with a with a particular team, you know, and then, you know, it kind of falls apart and, you know, another team comes together. So it, so for you, who is your like right hand hire that that you well it, as a producer yeah my unit production manager or line mm -hmm. producer is, is 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 a really important hire uh a, a, an accountant getting a good accountant is 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 priceless you know yeah and how about the ad the ad very important hire very important hire i don't consider that the ad is sort of i don't feel that i feel that that's only 50 percent my hire 
You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's like the AD has to get along. It's actually more important that the AD gets along with the director than, than me, um, right. uh, number one. Um, but the, the, the AD and I have to have an understanding about the way the set is going to be run and how they're going to re- respect, you know, the, the, the allocation of time, you know. Um, but that's a whole different, that's a little bit different than how important it is that the, the AD is able to crawl inside the director's head and know exactly what they want before they ask for it, you know. Mm. Um, someone asked, and they're a great name, but I can't pronounce it. Um, how do you turn, how did you transition from studying at film school to actually being in production? Right. So the way I did it, you know, this is just the way I did it, is that um, I got a job at a sound stage. Uh, not too far. Uh, it was it was called Mothers on Fifth Street, and it was. I now I remember that. It was like about two blocks away from from NYU, and so mm-hmm. I started to work as a stage manager. And what I would do is I would work for a semester and then go to school for a semester and then work for a semester. And that and as it is happens in this business, that one job led to all the rest of them. Since then, you know, then I got some work with HBO and worked with H. You know, they they brought me on. You know, in their on air promotion department, and like I worked for you know a summer and a semester for them. And then I went back to school for a couple semesters and, you know, and then by the time I graduated, I was already producing, you know, gratefully, you know, wow. Wow. doing, well, doing awesome. small, small music videos, but, you know, I was already producing by the time I graduated. That's amazing because not only were you working the system, but you're working the, the uh, NYU system. Right. Sure, they were not as happy you coming and going. You know, that's. I, I think they were surprised I made. I got I, that. I I got my diploma actually. <laughs> exactly. They're like, you're walking, really? <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. You know, I think I think that that you're working both the things at the same time. And was that yeah. out of like, did you have a bigger vision, or were you just like? necessity i have to pay my rent and i want to get this degree yeah i mean it was a it was a combination of a lot of different things but um you know i would say that 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 experience gave me the 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 the, you know gave me the understanding that i wanted to produce you know by the time i graduated i knew like that was my Mm -hmm. thing producing you know Mm -hmm. um so it helped me find get that clarity you know because as i said as you mentioned i like i did a lot of dping you know along the way you know in that journey as well you know um, but but uh, but through the going back and forth between the it, and I started getting hired as production manager and then producer and I'd go back to school and take producing classes and but then I was like okay you know this is this is what's for me you know because I felt like for me I felt that I didn't want to just like a producer can get involved in the script get involved in the editing they can you know have all these you know choose the DP or have these discussions with the DP about the look you know and they can go and and dabble in a lot of different things whereas I feel like the DP like lighting camera that's that's your that's you're just dealing with lighting camera every day all day for <laughs> decades you know and I, I just I just I looked down the road and I was like you know what I don't that's not what I'm totally because you're also so interested in many things and many stories I, and yeah, I have a lot of different interests yeah it's true exactly and is there also do you like is obviously knowing you have a lot of leadership skills and not saying the DP is not a leader but they're they they lead a very specific part of the cadre. Right. It's true. It's true. That type of thing. Um, we are winding down a little bit, Daniel. This has been awesome. I have a question for you. So when, if you weren't doing filmmaking, what would you be doing? What would you like to be doing? Well, I, I one of my oldest friends is a producer named Eisen Robbins, and we always joke with each other about retirement. And and it's it, the jokes basically goes, and we, uh, hey, Eisen, what would you do? Um, you know, when, when you retire, what are you going to do? And, and Eisen will say, or he'll ask me the question and the answer will always be, well, I'd have a lot of time to go make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's also, and have you, do you find that you're still learning as you're going now? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Cause it's constantly changing. First of all, yeah, it's constantly changing. I mean, you know, the, 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 the marketplace, the, the way films are made, both like technically and how it gets out to the public are completely different than, than when I was in film school. And it's, and it's, a, it's a little heartbreaking for me. Um, and I'll try to finish up quickly because I know you're about to end, you know, that, um, you know, when I, was, when I was in film school, like I had all these, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer and Joel Silver and like all these producers that I looked up to and it's like, oh, I want to be like them, you know? And like, they don't that kind of producing doesn't exist anymore you know 
And, um, you know, it's just kind of funny. It's just like, you know, like if I was really smart, like I would know about, you know, how the algorithms, I'd be studying basically how algorithms work, you know, and be applying every, all, all my knowledge and focus and attention on like, you know, uh, using the algorithms to get my work out there to the broadest people possible. And, you know, people like the producers that I looked up to, they don't even exist anymore. You know, that way of producing doesn't exist anymore. So that's, it's constantly changing and you got to sort of know that and be aware of that. Yes, and, and at the same time, because you you are you know such a great artist and so sensitive, being using you know mathematical computation to decide should I take this film or not and run this through like my my like program or you know how it's how will this affect me financially? Maybe not you know the greatest path because it's also you've done so well really going on instinct and mm. and you know charisma. Well, they call it the golden gut. So, you know, if you got to follow your gut, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where can, if people want to uh, at least track you, where can they find you? Instagram, TikTok? Yeah, I'm on, on TikTok, I'm Producer Daniel. Um, you can uh, always go to my website, uh, danielsollinger.com, or, you know, follow, you know, if you want to get familiar with my work, you can see my, the, the films I've made on IMDb. Fantastic. That's great. Well, Daniel, this has been awesome and really means a lot that you came on. And oh, thanks for having me. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you, Liz. Okay. It's been good to see, it's good to see you. Yes, exactly. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, and tune in. And thank you, New York Film Academy, for sponsoring the 2020 series. Bye.